Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, I've just muted everyone but myself. Um, this is our sixth Bitcoin VR meetup. Yeah, number six. I can't do six with my fingers, but imagine that it's six. Um, and well, today we're going to do a virtual reality Socratic seminar. Um, did any of you ever go to a Socratic seminar? You can kind of raise your hand or send like a smiley if you've been to a Socratic seminar. You can you have an emoji. Yeah, you have an emoji button you can use. Awesome. So some of you know this. Some of you know how Socratic seminars are, are you know, kind of work, but I'm, I'm going to explain in a minute anyway. So, well, really thank you for joining this. I mean, the, the, the meetups keep growing. This is once again, um, you know, the biggest one we had yet. We have more people in the audience here than the previous one. So it keeps growing. It's awesome. So I think it's great that we can kind of be together, uh, even though we can't exactly be together. So this is pretty awesome. Um, we, if you're at home and you're watching this through the video live stream, then just so you know, uh, we have, you probably see the link on your live stream. We have the VR Bitcoin Telegram group, which is where you can join future events. Um, so definitely join that. It's t.me slash VR Bitcoin. Um, so we have today uh, two people with us. We have Michael Folkson with us, who is the, um, he um, actually manages and kind of organizes the London Bitcoin Devs Meetup, which is pretty good. It's really awesome, actually, if you've never been there. And he's been doing Socratic seminars for a pretty long time, so that's really great. And we also have Andrew Yang, um, not the past presidential candidate. You might know him as e-currency holdler from uh, Twitter and so on. And he's from Reaper Financial and also organizes the Bitdevs LA um, Meetup. So both of our hosts are actually doing Socratic seminars in the real physical mid space, and now we're doing it uh, in VR. So that's pretty cool. Um, so about Socratic seminars, um, if you've never been to Socratic seminar before, you should know that a Socratic seminar is like this open discussion about technical developments uh, in Bitcoin and the hosts will go over things like pull requests and mailing list uh, items and maybe papers that were released and so on. And the idea is this is not a presentation. This is not for them to teach you. This is supposed to be an open discussion where everyone can contribute and everyone can ask or just contribute anything to the discussion. And I'm going to show you how, how you can kind of participate so you should be seeing a raise hand button popping up now on the bottom right of your um the bottom right of your interface and whenever you want to ask something or whenever you want to add something to the to the discussion you just click this button and whenever the host will open to uh participation we will have you join us this is super important. Again, this is not a presentation. What makes Socratic seminars special is that people participate and contribute. So please, please do contribute. Um, I guess one thing you should kind of know that is different in this Socratic seminar is that we are recording this and it is uh, being broadcasted live. Most uh, Socratic seminars are not being recorded. So keep that in mind. However, we do want you to kind of participate. And Wait, I think I'm going quiet, sorry. Okay, I hope I'm louder now. So, um, yeah, so keep in mind this is recorded, but we do want you to participate. And if, if you want, you can use a pseudonym, pseudonym too, so that's another option. Um, I guess another thing you guys should know is, yeah, so you, you should use those emojis that you use, that's great. And um, what we really want you to do is to see how Socratic uh, seminars like this are going and then start doing your own. So I'm not sure what's going to be the next best time to do Socratic seminars in mid-space, in physical space, 
but there are other ways to do Socratic seminars. You can do them in, in VR, like here, and you can do them uh, via video conferencing through Zoom. I think just today, uh, Stefan Rivera from uh, Sydney had a, a Zoom meeting for Sydney uh, people to do a Socratic seminar online, and you can do something like that. You can even maybe try, uh, a, you know, a text chat Socratic seminar thing. Everything is possible. But yeah, I, I really recommend that, that you take this and just do it uh, wherever you can, in your own community, in, you know, in your own space, in your own network. That's, that's the idea behind those. Um, I had, um, I think it was Michael and also uh, John Newbury came to Tel Aviv a few months ago to do together a Socratic seminar and they told us, they showed us how to do it. And since then we've been doing it there too. It's really awesome. And so this is the great thing about those seminars. You have, you, sh you have people showing you how they're done and then you can do that for your own community. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it for me. I'm gonna move over to, um, to Michael at this point. So I'll allow him to speak first. That's important enough. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Oh, it sounded good. Yeah. You, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. Are you, so, do you remember to amplify your voice? Uh, yes. Is it on yeah. pod? No, no, it's okay. I, uh, just, just okay. making sure. I think everyone's okay. Okay, so um, I don't know. Yeah, this is a little bit of a strange experience because this is interactive and I don't know who's in the audience apart from one or two. So uh, we'll try and keep it like quite high level and leave, uh, leave the opportunity for people to discuss a, a, a wide range of things. I thought we should probably start with, hello? Michael, should I try to do a quick, very quick intro round of people? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah. So we can't do intros for everyone, there's too many people. But just to get the interactivity going, uh, Udi said, is saying we'll do we'll do just like five introductions for people that want to introduce themselves. Obviously, you don't have to. Yeah, Go yeah, exactly. So if you want to introduce yourself in two sentences, just raise your hand right now. Let's test it out. Let's see how it works. Click on the raise hand button, and I'll I'll let you I'll let you speak. I'll I'll start. I'm Udi Vertimer, and I did a few of those. Um, and let's do Bill. Go hey, ahead. I'm Bill. Uh, I'm on, you guys see me in the loops as Billy Matt Doe. I am a Bitcoiner who likes going to shit like this. Awesome. Hi, Bill. Welcome, Bill. Hi. Welcome. Let's move on to the boy. Hey, guys. What's up? Matt Mano here joining you from the Bitcoin Center Miami. Thanks so much for putting this together. Appreciate it. Hey, cool. thanks for coming, man. Cool. Coming, man. No Anyone, else? Anyone else? We have a couple, have a couple these emojis. Uh, Brit, Brit, you're on. Hi, everybody. I'm Brit Kelly, first VR. Oh my God, I'm so Hi, stoked. Brit. What's up? Hey. Hey, welcome. hey, welcome. Thanks for joining. Anyone else? Okay, I think that's it. I think we can go. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Should we introduce ourselves, or did you already do that, Udi? Udi's already done that. Yeah. yeah okay. I think we're good. We're for us. You can do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Let's get on with the agenda. Go. Ahead, go. Go for it. So, uh, so we've got uh, ten. We've got ten points on the agenda. The, I, I thought we should probably start with the last Meet Space conference for potentially a while, which was the MIT Bitcoin Expo. Um, there are a bunch of great talks and panels. Uh, I thought we'd focus specifically on the Bitcoin Core Dev Panel, as you can see on the slide. There's Corey Fields, John Newbury, Peter Waller, Amiti. Um, they talked about taproot status and some of the things they're excited and excited about with the future of Core, uh, build system, interfaces between modules. And uh, Amiti had a good uh, metaphor for how core developers determine which PRs to review and which uh, parts of the code base to focus on. She called it pheromone drift development, where it's ants release pheromones. And if something's particularly exciting or particularly worrying, like a bug, all the ants scurry over to that part of the code base. And 
and and that's how they they decide how to split their time because anybody who's looked at uh, the core GitHub repo, there's just so many PRs, there's so much review to do. Uh, it's just it's really really hard to prioritize. Um, so anybody in the audience uh, did. Did anybody watch any of the presentations from MIT Bitcoin Expo? Any thoughts on core development? Anyone currently developing, currently contributing to core? Anybody wants to contribute to core? I'll open it up to uh, participation. Yeah, raise your hands if you want to comment. You can raise your hand, don't be shy. <laughs> Did anybody watch it? Was, that, was everyone just too scared with Corona that uh, nobody watched the live stream? There were very few people in the audience. It was just as Corona was kicking off, maybe a week ago. And the web swing. Web swing, go ahead. Hi, you know, I just wanted to, your question is very open-ended, Michael, <laughs> but I think maybe it's worth mentioning that we, I know we have at least uh, a couple of core contributors in the audience. One of them is on the left here, Andrew Chow is uh, is over there. Oh, awesome. the bl the dark oh, hey, blue robot. Hey, Andrew. In his brand new Valve Index. <laughs> Love that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Chow awesome. also is uh, doing like HWI integration, and um, it's really cool in Bitcoin Core. So Andrew obviously focuses on like one aspect a lot. It kind of varies between people like Andrew who just do so much incredible work on one particular aspect of the code base and then other people that kind of move around, review different parts, uh, kind, kind of try and fill the, fill the plugs in when, when PRs that are really important just aren't getting the love and attention they need. Um, but Andrew, did you watch anything from Bitcoin, from the Bitcoin Expo in MIT? Any, anything particularly interesting? Andrew, if you want to jump in, I'll need you to click the raise button so I can the raise hand button. You don't have to. It looks like he's trying to okay. figure it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go okay. ahead, Andrew. This one. Uh, well, okay. Uh, so, yeah. So I was at MIT um, for the whole conference, and yeah, if you watch that whole panel, uh, there was a lot of interesting points made during it. Although one thing that um, there, so at the end there was a question about like. How do you avoid uh, uh, like maintainers doing like taking control or something? Um, and I, I wanted to like add on to uh, uh, that the response to that, which is like the maintainers have fostered a uh, I guess attitude of not being jerks. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, like like there's a concern of of uh, maintainers or contributors doing bad things, but or just being kind of dictators. And the maintainers have thus far only promoted people to maintainers who are following the ethos of of not really um, being a dictator and more of just janitorial merge things as they are needed. Uh, and when we get acts and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thanks. And Maybe maybe a few years ago there was this discussion on whether there should be a benevolent dictator or not, and I think we've kind of moved so far away from that now that I think we've kind of settled on this decentralized um, and pheromone-like model. Um, but cool, thanks for thanks for Andrew. I'll move on unless anybody else. Uh, Michael, we also have Insta Gibbs raising his hand. So oh, I'll, cool. I'll... Awesome. Insta Gibbs, you're on. Hi, you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I do part time part time contribution. Uh, I do a lot of wallet stuff. Mostly review Andrew Chow stuff actually these days. But uh, my model is whatever's bothering me, I go and try and fix it or help people review something, fix it. So that's my motivation. Cool. 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 Thanks for sharing. That's it. I'll move yeah. on to the next one. Let's go on. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the next uh, one on the agenda was the 10 Code Labs podcast. Um, so there's there's a couple on the agenda today, the exploring the history of Bitcoin Core. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, the history of Bitcoin Script later. But this is talking about some of the 
problems we've had ensuring consensus on Bitcoin protocol. So Peter Willer appeared on the Chainpoint Labs podcast. He talked about some of the forks or unintentional forks we've had over the last few years. Uh, there's one where uh, there was a problem moving from dark DB to level DB that caused a fork in the chain. There's another one when OpenSSL was doing some things around signature validation. But Almost everything in core at some level you could consider to be consensus critical. Um, like, you know, you might not consider the GUI to be consensus critical, but you know, what if there's like a buffer overflow that runs into memory that's in consensus code and causes problems there? Like you could call that to be consensus critical. So uh, it's really hard to, you know, we have a section, a module in core that's called consensus, but even if uh, you're not touching that at all, some, sometimes what you do could have an impact on consensus. And that, that's a that's a problem that we have, um, but but thankfully uh, C plus plus is a little bit harder to do stupid things than C is. So at least you know a buffer overflow isn't actually that possible, uh, except when we work with raw pointers. But we never do that. Cool. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody else? Great. Anybody else uh, listen to the podcast? Any thoughts? Guys, feel free. Feel free. Don't be shy. Okay, I guess we can move on. Okay. So this one is All right. Andrew. Yep. Uh, cool. So recently, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, there's this new company that released a LN derivative market, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, basically, some of the problems that they uh, bring up that they're hoping to solve is that a lot of times with uh, Bitcoin trading, uh, it has to be custodial. And so you have to deposit Bitcoin into their exchange. And another problem is that, um, you know, when you withdraw it, it takes a lot of time because you got to wait for Bitcoin confirmations. And so one of the things that um, they're enabling with the Lightning Network is, you know, you can have non-custodial ownership of your Bitcoin. And the primary reason for that is because you can instantly deposit and withdraw uh, your Bitcoin from this derivative exchange. And um, other two other aspects that um, he highlights is that, you know, it's auditable. So you know how much um, Bitcoin you have and how much Bitcoin the other uh, the exchange has. And then, um, yeah, and so, does anybody have any? So I just thought this was really cool because it's offering like um, a use case built on the Lightning Network, and um, it's a pretty practical use case. I think I'm not sure how large or how much volume they're doing, but um, it is pretty interesting to see them use this. So uh, does anybody have any other thoughts about how um, maybe the idea of Ellen Derivatives Markets or any other companies leveraging Lightning Network in their business models? Go ahead, guys. Click that button. Click the phrase and button. We have a group of shy people today. Yeah. Is Watson great? Well, maybe, yeah. No? Maybe yeah, we're not what? asking great That's questions. Watson great, Sandra? Anyway, I'll ask a question while we wait. Um, so, is this using discrete log contract, like Taj Dryger's construction, or is this something uh, more I, trusted? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think um, you literally just open up a lightning channel to their uh, uh, to their um, node, and then they just keep track of the accounts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What so are you pressing any other... for? Uh, are you pressing your? Well, actually, it's waving. He really wants to speak. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a way because I'm not seeing him on the list for some reason. So I'm trying to figure out a way to let him speak. Anyway, just a moment. Coindesk is going to be giving you terrible reviews after this. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I just, it's just a minor thing I saw uh, in, in, in the text that you've put up. It says uh, funds are streamed instantly for payments, margin, and PL. It occurs to me 
that might be a cool use of lightning. I haven't thought this through, but I guess, I guess you know, obviously you have uh, dynamic margin requirements as positions change in the market. You know, if, as prices change, uh, your margin requirement changes. Uh, so I, I guess that is actually a really interesting usage of streaming payments with lightning. Uh, is that what that actually means? Uh, that's my question. The last line on, on the text in, on the screen. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not 100% sure. They didn't really dive into detail on that feature mm -hmm. in the blog, so I wouldn't be able to comment. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thanks. Maybe someone else knows? You can raise your yeah, hand. Anybody, anybody from the Lightning World here? Yeah? Well, looks like a no. If, by the way, if um, for some reason I'm not seeing you, oh, we have someone. Um, Michael, Michael, you are on Michael. Hi there. Um, about a year ago, I was working on a project we called Octanium that was um, that ultimately didn't uh, reach flight stage. But uh, basically, it was a, a uh, supply chain blockchain for oil and gas. And given the amount of, of oil and gas that's uh, spot traded on the world markets, Lightning Network would be something that would definitely be uh, useful for streamlining a lot of those transactions. So I think any sort of uh, commodities trading uh, of any type would uh, definitely benefit from this, um, to dealing with uh, supply chain. The big thing, reason that we're applying blockchain to supply chain is a beneficial for you know, no matter how you're using it, is that um, it, you, you can reduce loss or either or identify where losses are happening in the supply chain. And in a lot of supply chains, you get significant losses, like in oil and gas, for example. Depending upon the country you're in, you could have losses anywhere from 5% to 50% of total throughput. And identifying where those losses are ha happening with blockchain helps identify fraud, theft, as well as you know, natural losses like evaporation or, or leakage or whatever. So I think that you know, having something streamlining trading with Lightning Network could definitely be beneficial for any sort of supply chain application. Yeah, uh, there might be some possibility with like the Lightning Network. Um, I know there's like maybe the RGB protocol where they're trying to like, um, where you can tie tokenized assets to the Lightning Network and therefore you can add um, an asset like oil to this LN derivative market. But uh, another option could be liquid and um, creating a tokenized asset on that and creating a derivatives exchange based off of that. I think I think their uh, block times are just like a minute. Um, yeah, so it's like or two minute, two and a half minutes. So it's it's pretty fast settlement. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Does somebody from Blockstream have a comment on on Liquid and how they could potentially build a derivative exchange for a tokenized asset like a like oil? Maybe not Grubles. Yeah, I suppose the question is Liquid versus Liquid versus Lightning was like this type of application. Which would which, which yeah. be better? Yeah, Gregory, you're on. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. Um, Lightning is a second layer, fast, very fast settlement, while Liquid is more of a, oh, it's a uh, caching network, right? And then Liquid is just another settlement network. So it really depends on what you need. I mean, two minutes might be too slow for settlement for your purposes, and then you want Lightning for that. Yeah, that's true. And um, um, one of the of course there's one of the limitations the requirements, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, one of the limitations of Lightning right now are channel uh, requirements. Like, yeah, uh, but like with Wumble channels, um, you could technically open larger ones, so um, that may or may not be as big of an issue. Um, all right, let's go to the next uh, slide. Okay. Ah, sheesh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, one down. There you go. Cool. So the next item on the agenda for me was uh, Andrew Polster's talk on mini script at London Bitcoin Dex. If I've made uh, Andrew Charles here, then maybe I've switched up the agenda, but I'll be able to. There was there was an interesting discussion in the mini script workshop on the interaction between mini script and um, and descriptors, but maybe we can get Andrew Charles to talk about that. Basically, the 
The first half of Andrew's presentation in London was talking about the history of script and talking about the complexity and the sharp edges. Uh, it was a really interesting uh, conversation on what Satoshi was thinking when he um, designed the script. And it was Andrew's thought was that he'd just taken a very old language before and just made a few modifications just to see what worked. Um, but very little like signs of planning um, <clears throat> or even experimentation. Um, so, that, so that was really interesting, just on the script. I'd recommend if you're interested in learning more about script, watch the first half of that presentation. The second half talks about MiniScript and what MiniScript can offer. Um, so some summaries of MiniScript. Um, if you're interested in analyzability, if you're interested in um, minimizing fees when you're constructing a script, um, composability, if you have an existing multi-sig setup and you want to integrate existing multi-sig setup within a more complicated, broader multi-sig setup. Uh, there's, just, there's just tons of applications for MiniScript, and it'd be interesting to see which ones are used and which ones are found useful. But maybe I can ask Andrew to talk about um, what he discussed in London and how that interacts with Andrew's work on MiniScript. And, and real quick, with like Miniscript, it's like from a high level perspective, um, like writing script is really, really hard. It's really complicated. And once you screw it up and you send Bitcoin to it, like you're screwed, there's no like recovering it. And so Miniscript is just a way for uh, people to write complicated scripts in a safe and secure way. Uh, and so it's, it's abstracted in, um, in a certain sense. But Andrew, do you wanna, yeah, you wanna comment more? I think you got to raise your hand yeah. and then Udi has to give you permission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You but, uh, go ahead. So, so the first half of Polstra's talk is mostly him whinging about script, um, <laughs> which I mean, it's a, it's a, he has many legitimate complaints about it and it's uh, like script is Bitcoin script is really hard to reason about. So Miniscript makes that a lot easier. Um, and uh, Miniscript is related to the descriptors stuff in core. So we have, uh, I have some PR to uh, use descriptors in our wallet and eventually we'll get Miniscript. Um, so, uh, but Miniscript lets us do basically uh, anything kind of, <laughs> uh, any, like arbitrary script that you can arbitrary script policy that you can think of today can be done through Miniscript, and it uses a much smaller set of opcodes that you can easily reason about um, than the entirety of Bitcoin script. Yeah. And he made yeah, and he made the class a couple of times with like Bitcoin script and like Ethereum solidity type languages, and it's interesting that to get these uh, analyzability. Uh, property that's it actually had to shrink script so rather than expanding functionality to like a true and complete language which theorem what well, theorem's done you actually have to shrink it and actually uh, construct a subset of script so that we can actually start to get assurances on um the script that we've designed that uh, isn't going to lose us money or there isn't some edge case where uh, we haven't considered um someone managing to steal the funds within that complicated script. Cool. Okay. Anyone Any else want to make that before we move on? Even like yes. even even yeah. a beginner, like does, does a beginner uh, beginners in the room understand what what mini script is here for? Like does anybody does anyone, anyone even heard of mini script? Oscar. Oscar, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, Michael kind of answered this, but is it so? So, Miniscript and, and Bitcoin script, it's not like a TypeScript to JavaScript where it eventually boils down to JavaScript or this would eventually boil down to Bitcoin script. It actually is sort of a new set of commands that need to be created for this. So, so although, so, so uh, script is a stack, stack based. So uh, I don't know if you ever looked at like a Bitcoin script, but uh, but it's it's stack based. So uh, it's an abstracted okay, language so that you can write script. It's an abstracted language so that you can um, write more complicated script. 
Yeah, and piling yeah. opcodes on top of each other and then popping them off the stack, etc. Um, which is hard from a human readability perspective, um, but also hard to get the analyzability and the insurance as I was talking about earlier. So what you have is you have a policy language that's designed to be human readable. And so if you want to construct a complicated script, you should probably start with the policy language. And then that gets compiled down to Miniscript, and then Miniscript gets encoded to script. So Miniscript is just uh, an encoding of script. Um, if you want to be constructing these complex scripts, you should be using policy language, which looks similar to Miniscript, but is uh, just a bunch of tags that have been out, basically. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess that it would be so. It would be correct to say that that is not a, a good analogy. The TypeScript, JavaScript, it's not like that. It's a... No, I I would definitely say no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just more cool. Anyone else? Beginner question are welcome. All beginner questions are welcome. Uh, Zender, go on, go ahead. Hello. So. By my understanding, Miniscript uh, would eventually enable confidential transactions. Is this correct? And what's your opinion on this? Um, I don't know. I would. I. I so maybe maybe Andrew or yes, yeah, Andrew. Talk, I don't know. I would guess not. It, it does not. Can, it it does not. Okay. Um, Miniscript is purely just a way to reason about Bitcoin scripts. And if you can do something in Bitcoin script, Miniscript can probably do it. If you cannot do something in Bitcoin script, Miniscript most definitely cannot do it. Uh, so confidential transactions requires much more invasive changes and Miniscript does not do anything with that. And we would need a soft fork or a hard fork for confidential transactions. Yeah, confidential transactions mm -hmm. does more things with the transaction format. And so with Miniscript, we don't need a software card. It's just, uh, it's kind of uh, separate yeah. from the Bitcoin core. So, so you can use Miniscript today. Uh, you can go to Peter's website, make your own, write your own policy, get the Miniscript for it, get the scripts for it. And uh, in theory, you can use it today. Um, although it depends on whether your wallet will actually, you know, be able to use a script. Uh, you might have to write your own wallet. Um, but yeah, Miniscript is, not consensus related, it's not a fork, it's just an abstraction on top of existing script. What's the site, Andrew? Bitcoin.sipa.be slash miniscript. Or cool. Something like that. There you go. Yeah, just uh, search engine of choice and then search for SIPA miniscript. Yeah. Um, it'll be one of the top four options. But it's really easy to use. Like, you don't even need to go in the command line, it's literally just. Uh, copy and paste policies and mini scripts uh, into that website, and it will it will show you what the script would look like and uh, what opcode to use um, and certain parts of the analysis as well. So just play around with that website; it's really easy to use for anyone. Yeah, we also Anything have else? Gregory Rosenzel. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, just an example. Um, with Liquid, before we launched, we, you know like five smart guys in a room that and hand rolled our script for liquid, which is a multi-sig and then time lock to different multi-sig. Um, and then Miniscript came about and it saved, you know, it took like two seconds to write out a policy and we saved, you know, a bunch of bytes on it. So it's, it's kind of a way of just avoiding all this complexity. Um, and last, just an anecdote, uh, it's in production now. So Miniscript is being used in production, so it can be. Nice. And I'd also recommend uh, Andrew, Chow's, Andrew Chow's presentation in London is online as well. Um, uh, Chris Stewart did a presentation, James Chang. Uh, so all, all presentations from the London Bitcoin Dev are online now, and advancing Bitcoin presentations should be on hopefully next month. So there's lots of good stuff there. As, yep, that I'd recommend. Cool. Yep. Should we move on? Go on. Yep. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, this this is just some of the interesting history and script and speculating on what Satoshi was thinking um, when he designed script or 
basically just took port and made a few basic changes. So I'll pass on to Andrew for this item. Okay, so this is, um, I guess, an article from Shared Bits, and they are a Bitcoin company based in Chicago, and they're, they've got a seller stellar team over there. Um, I think Chris Stewart is one of them. And um, one of the, this is a blog where he talks about um, some of the things that we might need in order to run like an enterprise level lightning node. And so the three uh, problems that he brings up are invoice compatibility, liquidity reuse, and connectivity. And all of these three are based, basically built around like what happens if your lightning uh, node shuts down? Like how do you back it up? Do you have any uh, processes or um, yeah, methods in terms of uh, you know, backing up your lightning node? So uh, let's talk about invoice compatibility. For example, if you have one lightning invoice uh, tied to one node, and let's say you as an enterprise have like three or four lightning nodes just in case running, um, if I, as a customer, create an invoice uh, to pay, to, or you create an invoice for me to pay, um, is that invoice compatible with the main um, Lightning node uh, that's tied to your exchange, or can that invoice be used in, in, in your four other Lightning nodes? And so right now, how Lightning um, invoices are created, uh, they're not compatible across uh, different um, Lightning node implement um, nodes that you run. And so that's one of the problems that he brings up. Another one is liquidity reuse. So if your node goes down and you spin up a new one, um, does the liquidity that's pointed to the, the lightning node that you had, is it useless? And it is. And um, so that makes it really difficult because now you've got to open up another channel to this new lightning node that you spun up um, as a backup to the one that failed. And lastly is um, connectivity. Uh, so one of the things with Lightning nodes is you've got to connect to um, a, kind of like a, a, a Lightning ID um, connected with like an IP address as well. And so um, if that if your main Lightning node goes down, um, do you have a process or a method uh, for you to to this new node um, in a way that doesn't disrupt it, where they, maybe they have to open up another channel because now you don't share like the same um, known ID and um, in his in his talk um, for invoice compatibility, what he does one of the things he recommends is creating a remote database. Um, and for uh, liquidity reuse, another thing, one solution he suggests is something called um, locking. And then so you have um, several uh, ownerships of the same database at any given time, and um, and there's different ways to think about um, locking and and owning the liquidity. One of them is through exclusive locking, so only one node has access to the database at, at a time, and that's important because if if um, several different nodes uh, try to access the database at the same time and they're not aware that uh, like a payment has been made or something like that, then um, it will trigger a punishment transaction, and so you might lose your liquidity. And so um, another way to kind of manage uh, locking is something called um, optimistic locking, and so uh, there's like multiple owners, but um, there is a countermeasure in place so that uh, if a database has changed, if an invoice has been created and, and, and um, received, then um, yeah, then the other nodes will, will be let known that the database, the database has changed and therefore they have to reissue an invoice or something like that. And lastly, for ne connectivity, um, he recommends, or currently I think he's using for sure, but he's using something called NAT. Um, and so it converts an IP address that uh, lives behind a load balancer into a common IP address from the perspective of Lightning Node clients. And so that solves the connectivity issue. Um, so does anybody else have any other comments on maybe methods to solve these three problems or any other problems you, um, you have experience with running perhaps an enterprise level Lightning Node? Yeah, there's not many of them. Uh, in existence, I think, from an enterprise. I guess I think that's kind of what the show has been trying to provide materials so that enterprises do feel comfortable running this in production rather than just hobbyists. Um, but yeah, they're doing some great work. We do. Anybody? We have an MC raising his hand. Cool. And you're on. 
Hello. Okay. Um, I'm not running an, an enterprise node, but I'm running my, my personal experimentation node. And um, just two weeks ago or so, I moved it to another server with, or to a complete other hoster. And um, so the IP address had, has changed. And then the problem is that all the, yeah, all the, all the channels are still connected to the old IP address. So, um, and there is, I think, one week, it, it takes one week to, to uh, distribute the new IP address in the, in the, in the gossip network. And that's, that's some, that's a problem. I, I had the old server still and I, I used um, IP for, uh, I forwarded the port to the new server and so my channels uh, were still up and now uh, they, they moved to the, to the new IP address. But this, this binding on the IP address is somehow a problem, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thanks for that insight. So, yeah, so, yeah um, I mean, if there's any, any lightning people, lightning guys in the audience, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll just continue. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we have. Um, use... oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, let's let's try uh, open arms. Oh, cool. Hey, open arms. Thoughts oh, on hi, that? Um, Question? Yes. Uh, hi, I just, I just like to make a comment that this is mainly a problem if the node is receiving payments. If you have two, if you're running two nodes parallel, or you know, any, any number of nodes you like, uh, and you are just delivering payments with them, then it's it doesn't matter from which you are, uh, you know, paying from. So you know, this is just a comment that if the stream of uh, money is one direction outgoing, then you know, the failover is not that difficult. That's a good point. And you could you could yeah. use four instead of IP addresses. That's one, and then two. Uh, which which implementation are you using? Because they kind of have at least uh, LND and C Lightning have different uh, backup strategies. Which implementation are you using? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm using LND, but that, this will be true for anything. Oh, so sorry, this was the yeah this was the previous uh, guide. Sorry, I'm not. Can you? Oh, the interactive. Would you want to talk to the, the, the guy who asked the original question? He was talking. He was worried about um, relying on IP addresses before open ones. Um, it's, not, it's not a big deal. Oh well, yeah, I think there was. But uh, depending on whether it's LND or C, was that? I think there was MD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but it's it's too late. I have many open channels like for over a year or so, and I. I don't want to close them, and mo most of the channels I had problem with with incoming connections like like mobile mobile and, and uh, wallets. So I, I would like to have them not cut off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think um, this is still an issue, and it's you know Lightning is still early, you know, and um, I think that's one of the reasons why they have such long timeouts uh, just to protect. Yeah. Um, and the worst case scenarios for tech users. So that way, but, but is this something you have, had to have in mind if you if you transfer your node to another IP address? You yes. have to plan for that. Yes. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Um, yeah, there should be more resources out there, I think, if you want to... Because it sounds like your node is pretty useful and it sounds like it's well-connected. And so, yeah, maybe when if people want to... Uh, create a, a useful node and a well-connected node, then they should. There should be like an article or something or a disclaimer where people find out. Oh, these are the steps that I should keep in mind um, if I want to be a well-connected routing node. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's so, go to the next. There's nice thing the agenda later on on LND safety. We'll revisit this uh, on the LND safety agenda point. Great. Um, so I'll move on to the next. Um, one. I can, well, if we if we have time, I can. On uh, another wave, a few people raising their hands. Okay, okay yeah, go for it. I mean, I have time. Okay, let's let's go for OMG BTC. Howdy, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so a couple things on that that I was thinking about is uh, if you use a Tor hidden service address, um, potentially that can be moved around to different IP addresses. 
with that with keeping the same URL. Um, I don't know if it supports DNS either, or uh, I know in a lot of the cloud uh, service providers, you can just use a, a global load balancer that can transfer or point that IP address from uh, one region to another region. So you can maintain the, uh, uh, the system that way. Um, so those, those are a couple options that I thought about. Yeah, I'd, I'd certainly recommend though, if you are going to uh, attempt to do that with a large amount of funds to speak to the, speak to the implementation devs and make sure you're, you're not going to do something stupid if there is, if there is uh, serious money rather than just pay money. Because as Andrew said, it's still very early for that type of, um, those types of activities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's do Bitcoin SIT. Bitcoin SIT? Bitcoin SIT. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? So yeah. on the on the topic of uh, IPs that changed, I had lots of problems in the past while running my LND, LND node. It was not a production node, but it was a home node, very well connected. So the way I solve it, as many of you suggested, is to use Tor. And then your IP can change the, as much as it likes and the Tor URL would stay the same. And the benefit is you don't review your true IP. So, and, and also the, the amount, the percentage of nodes running under Tor in the Lightning Network, is, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's about 30 or 40%. So I think it's a, it's a good choice. And on the, yeah. on the slide there, yeah, sure, sorry, go on. No, you go. Yeah, another another question that I have is on this slide. Uh, I I also had problem with uh, because I run L L N D and L N D has a internal database on disk. Yeah. If I'm not wrong, it's a it's a GoLang key value store. I opened uh, an issue to them so that we could use it distributed. And the slides mentioned to use a a single database shared by multiple nodes, which implementation is doing that and how, how, how can that be achieved? So um, I think Sherbis is using a Claire NC Lightning. I, I don't think LND, you're able to do that with LND yet. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I think this was a Claire right. or at least what Chris presented in London, it was a Claire mode. Yeah. Because okay, it's very dangerous to shut down again. a node and start again. What was that saying? I didn't hear that after. No, no, I was saying that uh, it's very dangerous to shut down a node uh, in, a, in a server and, and it starts again in another server because the state, if they state, if you are unlucky enough and the state change, you, you lose our funds. So the shared database looks uh, an interesting choice, really. Yeah. Yeah, they're, I think they're using Postgres, so you might want to look into maybe switching an implementation um, if you want to, yeah, to Claire maybe. Okay. But yeah, this is, this, is, this is preparation for future setup. Like, we're not at a stage yet where we can safely do some of this stuff, uh, like ourselves, without guidance from Titan Dev or short -tip. Okay, I'll, I'll go back to open on, so it's raising is that again? Okay, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Just another comment that uh, indeed to the EP, IP, uh, changing IP problem, uh, uh, the Tor address, obviously, you can, you can uh, run the private key to, to any other location. So that is, that is a solution. Also, if you are not using the server's own IP address, but you use a reverse, reverse SSH tunnel to another server, which you can continue to maintain, or even a dynamic DNS or a domain would work. But obviously, if because it takes uh, some time to propagate, it's best to make your peers connect to the new address before you um, b before you migrate the node. So you know you can run with multiple um, multiple addresses. So you can have at the same time an IP, a domain, and your Tor address shared. Uh, and multi and different peers connecting to different kind of points like that. So, uh, but you would need to contact them for sure. It's it's the problem with the Tor address is that the ClearNet nodes cannot connect to them. So you need to reach out and connect to connect to those uh, when the 
when the address is changing or where the, where the node restarts. But for that, like a reverse SSH tunnel or like a domain uh, name would be, would be working better. So it needs to be planned. Yeah. 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 Thanks, uh, thank you. Okay, thank so you. Um, MZ once more to you again. Go ahead, MZ. Yeah, uh, just a short comment. Um, there, there's, uh, if you want to really move um, any Lightning implementation from one host to another host, just stop it, then co copy all of the data over and start it on a new one, all of the configuration file. Um, there should be no problem because uh, if, if your server is down or your service is down, there can't, can't be any changes and then you start it up on a new one. You should, be, uh, you should ensure that the old server doesn't come up and then um, 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 everything get, gets confused. That's, that's important. Only run it at one time on, the, on, on one server. Yeah, but uh, take, uh, um, uh, maybe it's reckless. Maybe the safe, safe thing is close all channels, move it and then open all channels again. But uh, yeah, <laughs> don't experiment with too much money. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we have to be careful with that separation. With the serious money, definitely close your channels. If you want to play around and try and get this working with small amounts of money, then, then go ahead. And it's not a long-term um, problem. We'll, we'll get over this in the long term. It's, there's, there's a lot of work to do and small, smallish development in developing. Yeah, uh, Bitcoin Omnivore, you had your hand up, but looks like you put it down. Do you, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Uh, Woody, we should okay. move along after let's, let's this move on. last let's move comment. On. Yeah. yeah. Let's move on. So, next slide. Okay, so the next item is uh, Glad Nomeco has opened up. Uh, the ALA uh, pull request in Bitcoin Core. For anybody who doesn't know what ALA is, uh, it reduces bandwidth requirement such that you can increase the number of connections that you have that appear on the network, without drastically increasing your bandwidth requirements. So why is this important? Well, um, one of the better defenses against um, eclipse attacks is to have a large number of connections and ideally maybe some stable anchor connections. Obviously an attacker is seeking to control all of the peers that you connect to and so the more connections you have and the more safe and uh, if you have some stable connections this makes it really really difficult for any attacker to um, execute that eclipse attack. So um, there's some great resources to read about it if you're interested in looking at the code uh, the PR is up on the screen. Um, one interesting observation was that it's 8,000 lines of code, which is a lot, uh, but only about 1,000 of them is, um, is, the, is the important part. 7,000 is just a, a mini sketch uh, thing. Um, but it's great that there's code, and it's great there's a PR up there. Anybody having some uh, LA, um, everyone understand? What Glad's trying to achieve with Erle? Anyone? Anybody? I guess we can move. No. I guess we no. can move on. Okay. Sorry, I got this, Udi. All right, cool. So I came across this Bitcoin PR at the Bitcoin PR Review Club, which I highly recommend people attend. I've attended the last two and it's I've learned so much. And the great thing is that you get access to like uh, Bitcoin core devs who like directly answer your questions. And so um, last week, uh, we covered um, how to improve coin selection for destination groups uh, over 10. Um, tomorrow, they're going to be talking about um, changes in coin database uh, and, um, some, and how to resolve some of the issues or comments that were left over when they changed from 
uh, the coin database being keyed by transaction as opposed to now being keyed by outputs. So you can check them out at Bitcoin .reviews, uh, Bitcoin Core .reviews. Um, read the material beforehand and join the session tomorrow. Uh, it's in the morning PST. Um, all right, so what this uh, PR uh, talks about, first we've got to kind of understand, um, well, okay, so this PR has to do with coin selection, it has to do with address reuse, and it has to do with helping Bitcoin Core users maintain their uh, privacy. And um, so the problem, the problem that this PR addresses is, uh, let's say you have a Bitcoin address and there's 10 um, uh, outputs associated with that address. And let's say you were to send five of those um, outputs to address A, and later on you decide to make a separate transaction and send the other five outputs to address B. Now, what you've done from, you know, and what a chain analysis company can do is they can figure out, oh, well, since this um, Bitcoin address has two outputs uh, to address A and B, well, they're, they're the same owner. And so that's not ideal. Um, it's not great for privacy. And so um, what this, so how Bitcoin Core functions right now, uh, what it does, it, um, yeah, it's, what it does is it takes, instead of when you make that first transaction to address A, uh, it spends all 10 outputs at the same time and the remaining is sent to a change address. And so this is a lot better uh, for privacy. So you are no longer associating with two separate addresses, but like with one. Now here, here's the bug. Here's the bug that um, this PR is trying to address. So let's say hypothetically you have 12 outputs. Um, each of those outputs are one Bitcoin, and um, and you have and you want to send one Bitcoin. So what? Uh, how Bitcoin Core currently uh, addresses coin selection right now is that it groups. Oh, okay. And sorry. Lastly, they have 12 outputs. They have um, each of those are one Bitcoin, and there's two groups. There's a group of 10 and a group of two. Like that's how uh, your Bitcoin core will uh, group those outputs right now. And so using a avoid a reuse, you would expect to have 10 inputs of one Bitcoin uh, of that transaction and get uh, nine Bitcoin changed back. But because of this bug, you will have two inputs of one Bitcoin and instead have one Bitcoin change. Um, so the two inputs that were grouped together before are um, are chosen because it has lower fees because they want to give it uh, lower fees. They you want to um, choose the output that has like lower fees. So uh, you have twelve outputs again. One last time, uh, t it's grouped into ten into two. Your Bitcoin Core will choose the the group of two because it ha because it has lower transaction fees um, as opposed to assembling compiling ten outputs into a single transaction. Therefore, um, this isn't really ideal because the whole point of um, grouping all 10 outputs together is to improve privacy and to group all those UTXOs into a single transaction. Um, and so this solution, he, uh, he simply says, well, let's, um, well, first he asks the question, like, why is the limit 10? Like, why isn't it larger? And then in the, in the PR, they discover, oh, it's, it's just an arbitrary number that um, somebody suggested. And so he recommends um, just expanding it to 100. Um, now this PR hasn't been merged and they're still in the discussion phase, um, but by expanding the, the group um, to 100, um, now, you know, it doesn't matter, like from a personal uh, user, I don't expect anybody to have more than 100 uh, outputs associated with the Bitcoin address. And so, um, you know, whatever outputs that they have with the Bitcoin address, it will now be grouped together and um, sent in a single transaction and therefore um, like better improve a person's privacy. Does that, yeah, does anybody have any questions about this PR? That was a kind of a lot of information to go over. Yeah, we have Andrew. Yes, Andrew. So my understanding of the original 10 limit or just having a limit in general is that uh, it's to avoid ridiculously overpaying on fees. Yes, um, that's correct. So like a uh, hundred seems to me like it would possibly induce a lot of fees. Uh, and and avoid reuse is a setting on the entire wallet. It's I don't think you can like 
just turn it on or off depending on the transaction. Um, so it could be a problem that people who use this end up accidentally paying far too much on fees than they should, especially with like dust spam attacks. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Part of the problem is that, um, like this is a way to help non-sophisticated Bitcoin core users, uh, manage their UTXOs. And so if you're, if you're, if you're pretty sophisticated, if you're keeping track of your own UTXOs and you know what you're doing, um, then this really isn't a problem. But, but for by and large, if um, a lot of people who use Bitcoin Core, maybe they're not the most sophisticated, maybe they don't, they aren't able to create their own transactions. And so um, this is why policies like these are kind of important. And it kind of speaks to a larger problem that Andrew brought up, like coin selection is always a very difficult problem to address and to really lay out because one minor, one small change can significantly affect like UTXO growth. Um, and it'll also significantly, um, uh, affect like, yeah, how much a person pays in terms of a transaction fee. So this is a pretty hard, um, problem really to kind of address, I would say. So yeah, it looked like we had a Bitcoin. Well, the transcripts of the Bitcoin called the Review Club are online. Um, uh, Merch has uh, a very long uh, master's paper on this subject. It's very, very interesting. Um, yeah, that was an interesting PR for last week. I don't know, I don't know which one they're covering this week. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll just say I see that people are uh, showing the hand emoji. Um, if you want to speak, the way to speak is to click on the raise hand button on the bottom right in case you're joined after we explain this. So you have on the bottom right of the screen a raise hand button. So click that and I'll be able to let you speak. Um, and we have wet swing. Uh, oh, am I? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just spitballing here because I haven't looked into this. So it might be just nonsense, but. I'm thinking like in scenarios where someone's got fairly heavy address reuse or, or any address reuse, you could you could maybe take this policy of like almost treating it like a quasi separate wallet. Like if I had a bunch of like in your example, a bunch of one Bitcoin outputs uh, all sitting on uh, UTXO sitting with the same script pub key, then maybe just do the coin selection entirely from that set or not at all. So like if you were saying an example of 12 and there's some weird behavior where you, well, you have some limit of 10 because you don't want to spend too much fees, but maybe yes. just make a transaction, maybe just make a transaction with whatever the wallet considers a reasonable number of inputs from that set of 12. So it might be two, it might be three, it might be one, whatever. And just, you could just keep doing that. But my idea was just that if you, if you did that um, in such a way that you weren't connect as long. See, it seems to me the only real issue that you're trying to avoid is combining, where possible, combining um, that reused address with other addresses in the wallet. So if you just kept using that as, well, I'm not really explaining this very well. So I may, maybe you've got a vague idea what I mean. I mean you, you could just keep, I, in other words, isolate the usage of that address separately to the rest of the, the wallet as much as possible. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's such a hard problem to solve in terms of like chain analysis and associating different um, pub keys to your outputs and stuff. Um, I, even if you isolate or restrict use of that address, like you're still at some point you're going to spend that later. And then so wherever you spend the Bitcoin before and wherever you spend the Bitcoin after, they're still tied to the same address, right? And so I don't know. It's um, it's a hard problem to solve. It's it's like kind of a trade off. Like, do you do you go for efficiency um, and like how you user friendly this whole process can be, um, or do you choose prioritize privacy? Um, yeah. Yeah. We also have MZ raising his hand. All right, MZ. So um, just um, if you if you want to look how how you can, could implement it there in the Electrum wallet, there's a feature to just freeze one address. That's also, you have to know by freezing that and you have to consider to unfreeze it. 
uh, when you will use it again, but uh, just just to look how it could be in, in, uh, implemented, uh, maybe maybe look to to the Electrum guys and just take take a look and maybe there is an inspiration. Yeah. Interesting. I don't think we um, discussed that in the short PR uh, review. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm using this. Yeah. You can, you can go uh, on, MZ. Hi. hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, I just wanted to mention, because MZ mentioned the freezing. Obviously, this is all part of the same story, but we, we just uh, released uh, the latest version of Join Market, which nice. also does the same thing. But it, it just it does the same thing, which is to, but it specifically automatically freezes uh, reused addresses uh, uh, below, as long as the amount is below a user-defined threshold. Right. Um, and of course, the, you know, I think by now most wallets that have this feature, certainly Join Market has it, but Core had it from God knows when, from the beginning, I guess, almost you, this coin selection thing where you can specifically choose. But the thing I was thinking specifically about this, and maybe it's not a well considered thought, is just uh, a little bit like you have, you can have separate accounts. You can, you can in some sense isolate usage of one address, uh, but, um, but yeah, coin selection is obviously part of the, the and, and also it's an interesting question whether we should have automated uh, freezing of reused addresses. Because of the reason we did it in Joy Market was specifically to avoid the potential of a, uh, an address reuse attack. Uh, sometimes people call it a right. dust attack. It's not actually a very right. good name because it's not specific to dust. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, that was actually uh, one of the topics we talked about in the PR Review Club. Um, you know, what dust attacks were, how this prevents um, or helps mitigate against um, this attacks. Yeah. I'll also add uh, Andrew Chow. Andrew Chow. Uh, yeah, so Core actually does kind of have a freeze function. Uh, it's not exposed in the GUI because the GUI, um, no one likes the GUI. But yeah. uh, there is a RPC that's, I believe it's lock unspent, um, where you can specify a particular output or outputs that you don't want to be included in coin selection. Uh, this could probably be expanded to do like addresses too. So like we are, we have functionality to like ignore addresses from coin selection, which is almost the same thing as the freeze address thing. It's just not in the GUI yet. Yeah, my my point was Elect Electrum GUI is not the it's also not the best GUI, but uh, it's it's somehow uh, somehow um, yeah visualized in what is not frozen and yeah yeah the the core GUI could definitely use some more work. Um, there are a lot of things you can do in the RPC that you can't do in the GUI. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's the right, right thing to expose in the in, in, in the in the in the GUI such function because you can't freeze and forget about freezing all balance. Yeah, it's it's not 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 easy. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, we should probably move on to the next topic, Woody. Yeah. So, so for time, guys, I think we're already kind of we finish up within ten minutes. How does that sound? Okay. Sounds good. I I think okay. uh, the next time I'm, I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um. Has so this arm and. So this is the document I was talking about earlier. Earlier, we have done an operation for. Safety dot. That's it's pretty useful on the description. Really. That uh, if your implementation is LMD, there was some there was some guidance on there where it was saying mm -hmm. you've got to be careful. Don't... So there's explicit guidance there about what to do and what not to do. And if anything's unclear, then please contact them and include that dot for LMD. I and mean, hopefully there'll be other. Um, okay, let's go back to the previous one. 
So this is cool. This is uh, LMD as well. Um, so this is work that uh, Rose Leaf has done. PSVP. Um, and so this is really cool. Um, you can now, or at least with this uh, PR that's been merged, you can open channel. You can open the channel with a cold card wallet. Possible because uh, Rose Leaf has abstracted um, some stuff out of LMD. Um, there was, so yeah, much of the. Um, so now the, the, the funding out is agreed outside the normal protocol. That's kind of a brief summary of the change. Um, LMD does within its code base. Um, it's kind of monolithic in comparison to like Sea Lightning and Rust Lightning, which gives you more flexibility in certain aspects. But this is this is a really good step to allow LMD channels with hardware wallet. Any thoughts or questions on this? Anyone? Anyone want to raise their hands? I guess, I guess no one. Anybody excited to open a lightning channel with a hardware wallet? I am. Get some heart. Show us some love. <laughs> Show us some love. Yeah, I mean, awesome. like yeah. with PSPT, it's like really cool because then um, it's like more, um, you can more safe. I don't know, maybe potentially like a cold storage uh, situation or like a, a a warm storage situation with like PSPT. And um, it, if we combine this with like Alex's talk at the last VR meetup we did, um, a lot of their liquidity in cold storage and just keep, um, you know, looping out uh, channel liquidity. And so, like, that's, it's it's really cool to see stuff like this grow and um, any, any All right. I think we can move on. I think we can move on. Move on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I think we're... Okay. Let's um let's go to the oh, sorry, slide up above that. Oh, okay. Mike, did you talk about the safety operational operations safety guide? Uh yeah. 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 Okay, so that. we're on dual funded. Yeah. We're on du okay. Yeah. All right, the next topic is a dual And um, Nifty Nye, she is a, uh, or Lisa Nygut from Blockstream, she's the one who's kind of um, pioneering this uh, pull request and see lightning. Um, does anybody know, and kind of give us a short synopsis of it, if you'd like. And how is that different from how lightning channels are currently funded? We're nearing the end, so if you want to make, if you want to talk, this is your last chance. Yeah. Last item. Anyone want to talk? Click that raise hand button. Use this moment. No? I guess not. I guess okay. not. Okay. So dual funded okay. channels. Oh, let's are wait, 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 wait. Oh. We, have, we have open homes. Open homes. Go ahead. All right. Oh. Let's do it. Tell us about dual funding at homes. Sure. So, yeah. So, currently, as we open a channel, I think the funds are only on the side of Vampir, which has constructed and sent the funding transaction. In a dual funded channel, we would find a way to construct a transaction where both parties can contribute to the fund which are in the channel. So you will you would end up having a balance on both sides. So why would somebody, why would um, Nifty Nye be interested in um, pursuing something like dual funded channels? What problem does it solve? So, because if, if, the, if the channel, if the balance is only on one side, or on the opening party, is only able to pay at first and cannot receive payments through that channel he just opened. But if there are funds on both sides, then this problem is solved. So we have uh, two-way traffic from the start. 
Perfect. That's exactly right. So right now, um, uh, channel liquidity on the Lightning Network um, has been a little bit problematic. It's been getting a little bit better with stuff like Lightning Loop um, and sub submarine swaps through other services. I think Bolts.exchange also is another service that you can leverage. But basically, dual funded channels is a way to have um, someone receive and pay on the Lightning Network instantly. Um, Prior to this, you'd have to open a channel and then you'd have to loop out in order to receive liquidity in. And so that requires some, I don't know, you gotta wait a couple confirmations for, uh, for this whole system to get set up. But with dual funded channels, you can have this as soon as you create your channel, which is very, very nice. Now, one of the problems with dual funded channels is um, it requires you to put up capital. And so if you are a very well-connected node and everybody around you who's connected to you wants to create dual funded channel, ch ch dual funded channel, um, that's a lot of liquidity that you as a, a routing node have to give up. Um, and so um, I think it makes sense for people to have wanted to only create uh, unidirectional channels to start because it requires less uh, capacity for uh, for routers but um i think it's it's also a good sign for people to start um pushing towards dual funded channels as well and so if we move to the bottom uh the last slide here oh yeah okay so this is kind of a uh, nifty nice she kind of breaks down step by step how a dual fundal chan dual funded channel would um be created um and so you have uh someone on someone who's opening well, okay, yeah, you have person A and person B. Person A initiates an open channel. Person B accepts the initiation of the channel. Then the cool part is you can use several uh, UTXOs to fund this channel as well. And, and so that's what you see in step three. And um, finally, both parties have to say, hey, like the funding has been completed. And then you sign the commitment. And in this, um, you'll see that person A is the one who uh, broadcasts uh, the dual funded channel. And they're the ones paying for basically the fees to open this channel. But I was talking with uh, Lisa and she said she's currently working on a proposal where uh, both A and B, person A and B would be able to pay for the fees together. And so, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for dual fund channels. Uh, anybody have any comments? Anyone on dual funded channels? I think uh, Waxwing maybe? Yeah, Waxwing. Hi. Yeah, just a couple of high-level uh, comments about dual funding generally. Uh, the first one is you, you've already mentioned the uh, balancing of liquidity advantage, but the, the other advantage is that uh, uh, a dual-funded opening transaction violates the common input ownership heuristic. So essentially, it's technically a coin join, although you know usually we think of coin joins as something specific, more specific than that. So. From the point of view of breaking chain analysis, uh, it's an extremely useful thing if we if we develop this as being common. So that's, that's a very positive point. Uh, another point, um, which uh, is a very vague comment, but people might find it interesting to think about, is that um, on the Lightning mailing list, when they were talking about this protocol, they're a bit. It's it's a fundamentally different kind of protocol to one where one party just provides stuff and the other party receives it. Here, both parties are providing stuff to each other. So you have this issue that often crops up of, you know, what if somebody tries to basically grief me, you know, DOS attack me or snoop my UTXOs. So there's this issue of like, how do you make sure that, that there's a commitment from the initiator to make sure that, that they're not just going around the entire Lightning Network trying to snoop everyone's UTXOs, right? So there's a whole kind of discussion around that. Just thought I'd mention it, yeah. I didn't even think about it from a coin join perspective, but that's really great insight, Waxwing. Thanks. Yeah, and we also have OpenOM. Open? Maybe not. Hello? Maybe not. No? Yes. OpenOMs? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I was just very happy to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's just a heart. I love it. Yep. The kind of enthusiasm we want. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I great. think that's. I think we can wrap it up. We'll wrap up, shall yeah. we? Uh, guys, okay, I just want to say. I just want to give a huge shout out to Udi. He has. This has been. He's been doing like such great work. 
with like all the VR stuff thank and you. it's it's almost like a full time job. So Udi, thank you so much for all the work you're putting into hosting these VR stuff. It's like it really helps build the community. Thanks yeah, a lot. Anybody Thanks a lot, I think I mean, Udi must have helped me for about half an hour get set up. He's doing that for everyone. That's a ton of work. So thank you so much. Udi. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you guys, and very, thank yeah. you for coming. Thank you for very great. doing this for us. This was awesome. This was a great Socratic seminar. So really, thank you, and thank everyone for coming. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for coming, guys. This was great. Stay safe. And watch thank you for those participating. Hands. Make sure to check out River Financial if you're in the US, river.com. <laughs> Shameless plug.